So I'm going to talk about pre-cooling and mid-cooling for exercise performance in the heat. Um, so as Seth mentioned, if you're competing in the heat, then heat acclimation is your gold standard to manage your performance. Right? But pre-cooling and mid-cooling are really useful strategies to incorporate into that. Um, and it's gaining a lot of experimental evidence. So what is pre-cooling? It's a temperature regulation strategy where body temperatures are lowered prior to an event. So this event can be a race, it can also be training. So what's the basic rationale for pre-cooling? Why do we do this? So we have resting core temperatures of about 37 degrees. So when we exercise, this is going up for sure. Okay? And we have limited capacity to store heat. It's just a few degrees upwards. Um, and as we exercise, the greater the increase in core temperature, the greater the development of fatigue, the greater the decrease in performance. So it's a progressive phenomenon, which unfortunately can be accelerated by a warm up because now I'm starting at a higher core temperature with a smaller capacity to store heat in front of me. Okay. But if we pre-cool and lower our core temperatures by half to 0.8 of a degree, with the same warm up, we end up with a core temperature that's not that different from rest. Okay, so we've got all the benefits of the warm up, but we have minimized excessive increase in core temperature. So like this, in theory, at any given time, I have a lower core temperature, I've delayed the development of fatigue, and I've preserved my exercise performance. So this is the basic rationale. So how can we pre-cool ourselves? We have cold water immersion. We can wear ice vests. We can drink ice slurries. Under some circumstances, head face and neck cooling can be quite useful, or we can combine these methods. Oopsie. So, how effective are these methods? Um, this is a meta-analysis looking at the effectiveness of pre-cooling methods on exercise performance. So we've got cooling rests, we've got cold water immersion, we've got ingestion of ice slurries or cold water, cooling packs, unfortunately not much research in here, and mixed method cooling. So what's mixed method cooling? It's basically a combination. Okay? So in the literature, mixed method usually involves wearing an ice vest or a towel combined with ice slushies or cold water ingestion, okay? So, the good thing is, pre-cooling is not harmful, okay? But they have different degrees of benefit. So for example, cooling vest, small benefit. I've just made my own averages, okay? So cooling vest, small benefit. Cold water immersion, large benefit. Ice slurry or ice water, moderate benefit. Mixed method cooling, moderate benefits as well, okay? So, some important considerations when using some of these methods, cold water immersions, the gold standard for pre-cooling. Why? It's very effective in reducing body temperatures and it has a large performance effect. So this is the first study that looked at uh, pre-cooling by cold water immersion and they found that cold water immersion was really effective in reducing body temperatures which remained lower throughout a subsequent 30 minute uh, time trial compared with no cooling, which ultimately resulted in a 4% faster performance time. What are some limitations though? Okay. It's a very time intensive and logistically demanding procedure. Okay. And from what I've seen in the field, this is usually quite badly done. Okay. I'm not sure why, but I think it's often confused with cold water immersion for recovery. Okay. So this procedure here, for pre-cooling, your initial temperatures need to be 28, 29 degrees, and then it's gradually lowered to 21, 22 degrees. Okay, you don't have to follow exactly, but the point is you have to slowly habituate your athlete inside there, okay, to avoid you know, squall trusting him. So, there's a, a bridge version of this as well, where you pick a temperature between 20 to 25 degrees, and you immerse an athlete for 30 minutes. It works, but not for everyone. Okay, some athletes might find this range uncomfortable, but something warmer may not have an effect on your core temperature. So my advice is if you can't, if you don't have the resources to do this well in the field, then opt for more practical methods. So one practical method is the use of ice vests. So ice vests are really useful when warming up, okay? 
So there's a nice study here, it's a field study as well, that shows the effectiveness of ice wear. So with athletes here, with similar cold temperature, before a race, and then one group wore ice vest, the other group did not wear ice vest, and 10 minutes before the race, there was a, the ice vest group had lower core temperature, and this difference persisted at the start of the race and post-race as well. Other practical methods include ice slurry ingestion. So this is the first study that looked at ice ingestion as a pre-cooling method. The authors found that we found that pre-cooling was very effective in reducing core temperatures and improved mean split times of 40 km time trial performance. So it was faster throughout, but most of the performance gain was seen at the back end, which also contributed to an overall increase in mean power output and faster performance time. Drawbacks though. So ice can be quite uncomfortable to ingest. Okay, so for uh, the recommended dose to have any effect on core temperature is about 7 to 10 grams per kilogram body weight. So for a 70 kg person, that's about 500 grams. So if you freeze 500 mils of sports drink, that's going to expand. Yeah, so it's a lot of ice to consume and it can be quite uncomfortable. But it's a very mobile strategy. You can start before your warm up, you can bring the strategy into your warm up. So it's, it's practical, it's good that way. So how popular is pre-cooling in athletics? So this is a nice study that looked at planned cooling strategies um, in the athletes that competed in the 2015 IWF World Athletic Championships. Okay, as you can see, athletes from all disciplines had some form of cooling or pre-cooling in mind. Okay, so are they then relevant? For sprint events, is pre-cooling necessary? Let's see. Okay, this is another study that looked at running performances in hot and temperate environments um, in the World Athletic Championships from 1999 to 2011. And it shows that sprint events are not impaired in hot environments. They are in fact faster when environments were above 25 degrees. So is pre-cooling necessary? It seems like it's going to be more counterproductive. So lab studies agree with these, these findings as well. So this study here looked at repeated spin performance in hot compared with neutral environments. And they found that athletes started at a higher core temperature and skin temperature, and by extension, muscle temperature as well in hot environments. And that resulted in a high power output during a repeated spin sequence. Classic study by Sargent who showed that Decreasing muscle temperature, um, about five degrees or more, compared with rest, reduce peak force, peak and mean power during sprint cycling. Warming up the muscles, about three degrees above resting temperature, increased peak force, peak and mean power during uh, sprint cycling. So if you've got a sprinter who's gonna pre-cool and cools the active muscle in the process, that's gonna be detrimental for performance. I would say the same for field events. But field events are quite complicated. They last a long time, exposes the athlete to the environment, and if environments are really, really hot, that can precipitate fatigue. So there's a nice lab study that shows this. So this study here, passively heated subjects to a core temperature of 39.4, and then they cooled them back to 37.5, and at regular intervals did some knee exercises, okay? And what they found was, during passive feeding, there was a massive decrease in MVC force at a core temperature of 38.5. Yep, and that remained lower throughout passive feeding at higher temperatures, but the force recovered when the subjects were cooled back up again. Okay, so hot environmental temperatures even though you're just sitting around, can have a negative effect. So I'm just gonna say this, in sprint and field events, there's a very low risk of performance decrement. It's not, it's not gonna affect you, but under challenging environmental conditions, light use of cooling garments or cold beverage can be beneficial. Avoid cooling your active muscles, okay? These guys are not the Avengers, yeah. So, 
field and sprint athletes, be careful when you use pre-cooling. There are quite a bit of them using pre-cooling, okay? And over here, we've got sprinters and field athletes using whole body cold water immersion and leg cold, cold water immersion for pre-cooling. So this is a concern. This is a massive concern. Next, middle distance and long distance athletes, can they benefit from pre-cooling? So if you look at this data again, uh, it's quite mixed for 800 meters to 5,000 meters. I'm gonna say it's unlikely that your performance will decrease in 800 and 1,500 meters in the heat. Okay, so pre-cooling, the benefit of pre-cooling will not be there as well. For 5,000 meters, steeplechase, which is not here, it depends who you are, how heat acclimated you are, but it's gonna be under the bracket of being unlikely as well, I feel. But for 10,000 meters, marathon and race walk, which is not here, there's a high risk of your performance going down. Will pre-cooling help? Yes. In this study here, another, another meta-analysis that looked at effective, effectiveness of pre-cooling under different environmental temperatures. So in moderate temperatures, um, there was some improvement, there was some harm as well. Okay, so overall resulting in zero effect. So no benefit of pre-cooling in cool temperatures, or moderate temperatures, okay? But under hot environmental conditions, there is generally a benefit of pre-cooling, okay? Pre-cooling is really beneficial when the environments are hot, resulting in a net moderate benefit effect, okay? So in summary, pre-cooling works best in warm to hot environmental conditions. Pre-cooling offers no performance enhan enhancement in sprint and field events and can be detrimental if mu active muscles are cool. Mild use of cooling garments or beverage may be useful in very hot environments for sprinters and uh, field athletes. Pre-cooling is beneficial for endurance events, but 800 to 5,000 meters, likely not beneficial, okay? Again, depending on how acclimated you are. If you're using pre-cooling, best to avoid cooling your active muscles. We are severely lacking field experimental, uh, experimental data on these events over here. Pre-cooling would be ideal for 10,000 meters marathon and race walking, okay? I'll move on. Mid-cooling. So what is mid-cooling? So by definition, it's the application of cooling during an event. Okay, so pre-cooling is before you cool yourself and you go into the event, there is no turning back. Okay, so mid-cooling is during an event. So you're under some kind of heat stress here and you are trying to apply some kind of a cooling to manage that, okay? So how does mid-cooling help? So it depends on the amount of surface area you can cool it reduces cardiovascular and thermal regulatory strain by reducing your skin temperature, skin blood flow, and your heart rate. I think the greatest advantage is the psychophysiological aspects of it as well. So when you meet cool, there's a quick increase in thermal comfort and reduced perceived exertion. It's quite immediate. You feel it straight away. That's the feedback we get. That's the, what we see in the research, but it's quite temporary as well, so short-lived. Is mid-cooling effective? Unfortunately, not many studies in this area, but as of now, yes. What are some practical mid-cooling methods? Cooling garments, cooling collars, face cooling, okay, water dousing, ingestion of water, ice slurries. These are all fairly um, practical, but are they relevant for athletics, for field events? No, okay, not at all. For these guys here, relevant, not, not applicable. These guys here, yeah, why not? Yeah, possible, but is it then practical? Is, are there opportunities to include these methods in track events? Let's watch this video. Okay, as usual, these things won't work. Bottom left. Oh, yeah, there it is. Uh oh. The 
that's okay guys um that's fine this is a video i'm not sure if you're aware of mo farah 5000 meters 2015 world athletics uh, championship he will go we veer to the right grab some water face down sing and then comes back in okay just google that okay track event i'll leave i'll leave you to decide if that's practical or not okay but for road races very practical okay it's already being practiced dousing ingesting cold water okay ice no okay not it's not it's not easy to ingest okay just because not easy to ingest it's very popular in triathlon and cycling but running at this speed no way cold water is the way to go so quick summary mid cooling works best in warm to hot environments relevant for endurance events difficult to incorporate into track races no way great for road races and excellent training to ah, i didn't mention this earlier okay so it's great for training if you're training around the track doing 10 by 400 meters it would be great if you have a cooler box with some leg cooling device which you can rotate throughout your intervals all right thank you